This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anti-Federalist Papers Anti-Federalist No. 9 Letters from the Federal Farmer to the Republican Letter No. 7 December 31, 1787 Dear Sir, in viewing the various governments instituted by mankind, we see their whole force reducible to two principles, the important springs which alone move the machines and give them their intended influence and control, are force and persuasion. By the former men are compelled, by the latter they are drawn. We denominate a government despotic or free, as the one or the other principle prevails in it. Perhaps it is not possible for a government to be so despotic as to not operate persuasively on some of its subjects, nor is it in the nature of things, I conceive, for a government to be so free, or so supported by voluntary consent, as never to want force to compel obedience to the laws. In despotic governments one man, or a few men, independent of the people, generally make the laws, command obedience, and enforce it by the sword. One-fourth part of the people are armed, and obligated to endure the fatigues of soldiers, to oppress the others and keep them subject to the laws. In free governments the people, or their representatives, make the laws. Their execution is principally the effect of voluntary consent and aid. The people respect the magistrate, follow their private pursuits, and enjoy the fruits of their labor, with very small deductions for the public use. The body of the people must evidently prefer the latter species of government, and it can be only those few who may be well paid for the part they take in enforcing despotism that can, for a moment, prefer the former. Our true object is to give full efficacy to one principle, to arm persuasion on every side, and to render force as little necessary as possible. Persuasion is never dangerous, not even in despotic governments. But military force, if often applied internally, can never fail to destroy the love and confidence, and break the spirits of the people, and to render it totally impracticable and unnatural for him or them who govern, and yield to this force against the people to hold their places by the people's elections. I repeat my observation that the plan proposed will have a doubtful operation between the two principles, and whether it will preponderate towards persuasion or force is uncertain government must exist. If the persuasive principle be feeble, force is infallibly the next resort. The moment the laws of Congress shall be disregarded, they must languish, and the whole system be convulsed. That moment we must have recourse to this next resort, and all freedom vanish. It being impracticable for the people to assemble to make laws, they must elect legislators, and assign men to the different departments of the government. In the representative branch we must expect chiefly to collect the confidence of the people, and in it to find almost entirely the force of persuasion. In forming this branch, therefore, several important considerations must be attended to. It must possess abilities to discern the situation of the people and of public affairs, a disposition to sympathize with the people, and a capacity and inclination to make laws congenial to their circumstances and condition. It must afford security against interested combinations, corruption, and influence. It must possess the confidence and have the voluntary support of the people. I think these positions will not be controverted, nor the one I formally advanced, that a fair and equal representation is that in which the interests, feelings, and opinions and views of the people are collected, in such manner as they would be were the people all assembled. Having made these general observations, I shall proceed to consider further my principal position, viz., that there is no substantial representation of the people provided for in a government, in which the most essential powers, even as to the internal police of the country, are proposed to be lodged, and to propose certain amendments as to the representative branch, first, that there ought to be an increase of the numbers of representatives, and secondly, that the elections of them ought to be better secured. 1. The representation is unsubstantial and ought to be increased. In matters where there is much room for opinion, you will not expect me to establish my positions with mathematical certainty, 
you must only expect my observations to be candid, and such as are well founded in the mind of the writer. I am in a field where doctors disagree, and as to genuine representation, though no feature in government can be more important, perhaps no one has been less understood, and no one that has received so imperfect a consideration by political writers. The Ephori in Sparta, and the tribunes in Rome, were but the shadow. The representation in Great Britain is unequal and insecure. In America we have done more in establishing this important branch on its true principles than perhaps all the world besides. Yet even here I conceive that very great improvements in representation may be made. In fixing this branch the situation of the people must be surveyed, and the number of representatives and forms of election apportioned to that situation. When we find a numerous people settled in a fertile and extensive country, possessing equality, and a few or none of them oppressed with riches or wants, it ought to be the anxious care of the Constitution and laws to arrest them from national depravity and to preserve them in their happy condition. A virtuous people make just laws, and good laws tend to preserve unchanged a virtuous people. A virtuous and happy people, by laws uncongenial to their characters, may easily be gradually changed into servile and depraved creatures. Where the people or their representatives make the laws, it is probable they will be generally fitted to the national character and circumstances, unless the representation be partial and the imperfect substitute of the people. However, the people may be electors if the representation be so formed as to give one or more of the natural classes of men in the society an undue ascendancy over the others, it is imperfect. The former will gradually become masters and the latter slaves. It is the first of all among the political balances to preserve in its proper station each of these classes. We talk of balances in the legislature and among the departments of government. We ought to carry them to the body of the people. Since I advanced the idea of balancing the several orders of men in a community in forming a genuine representation, and seen that idea considered as chimerical, I have been sensibly struck with a sentence in the Marquis Beccaria's treatise. This sentence was quoted by Congress in 1774, and is as follows. In every society there is an effort continually tending to confer on one part the height of power and happiness, and to reduce the others to the extreme of weakness and misery. The intent of good laws is to oppose this effort, and to diffuse their influence universally and equally. Add to this Montesquieu's opinion that, in a free state, every man who is supposed to be a free agent ought to be concerned in his own government. Therefore, the legislative should reside in the whole body of the people or their representatives. It is extremely clear that these writers had in view the several orders of men in society, which we call aristocratical, democratical, mercantile, mechanic, and etc., and perceive the efforts they are constantly from interested and ambitious views disposed to make to elevate themselves and oppress others. Each order must have a share in the business of legislation actually and efficiently. It is deceiving a people to tell them they are electors and can choose their legislators if they cannot, in the nature of things, choose men from among themselves and genuinely like themselves. I wish you to take another idea along with you. We are not only to balance these natural efforts, but we are also to guard against accidental combinations, combinations founded in the connections of offices and private interests, both evils which are increased in proportion as the number of men among which the elected must be, are decreased. To set this matter in a proper point of view, we must form some general ideas and descriptions of the different classes of men, as they may be divided by occupations and politically. The first class is the aristocratical. There are three kinds of aristocracy spoken of in this country. The first is a constitutional one, which does not exist in the United States in our common exception of the word. Montesquieu, it is true, observes that where a part of the persons in a society for want of property, age, or moral character are excluded, any share in the government, the others, who alone are the constitutional electors and elected, form this aristocracy. This, according to him, exists in each of the United States, where a considerable number of persons, as all convicted of crimes, under age, or not possessed of certain property, are excluded any share in the government. 
the second is an aristocratic faction, a junto of unprincipled men, often distinguished for their wealth or abilities, who combine together and make their object, their private interests, and aggrandizement. The existence of this description is merely accidental, but particularly to be guarded against. The third is the natural aristocracy. This term we use to designate a respectable order of men, the line between whom and the natural democracy is in some degree arbitrary. We may place men on one side of this line, which others may place on the other, and in all disputes between the few and the many a considerable number are wavering and uncertain themselves on which side they are or ought to be. In my idea of our natural aristocracy in the United States, I include about four or five thousand men, and among these I reckon those who have been placed in the offices of governors, of members of Congress, and state senators generally, in the principal officers of Congress, of the army and militia, the superior judges, the most eminent professional men, and etc., and men of large property. The other persons and orders in the community form the natural democracy, this includes in general the yeomanry, the subordinate officers, civil and military, the fishermen, mechanics and traders, many of the merchants and professional men. It is easy to perceive that men of these two classes, the aristocratical and democratical, with views equally honest, have sentiments widely different, especially respecting public and private expenses, salaries, taxes, and etc., Men of the first class associate more extensively, have a high sense of honor, possess abilities, ambition, and general knowledge. Men of the second class are not so much used to combining great objects. They possess less ambition and a larger share of honesty. Their dependence is principally on middling and small estates, industrious pursuits, and hard labor, while that of the former is principally on the emoluments of large estates and the chief offices of government. Not only the efforts of these two great parties are to be balanced, but other interests and parties also, which do not always oppress each other merely for want of power, and for fear of the consequences, though they in fact mutually depend on each other. Yet such are their general views that the merchants alone would never fail to make laws favorable to themselves and oppressive to the farmers, etc. The farmers alone would act on like principles. The former would tax the land, the latter the trade. The manufacturers are often disposed to contend for monopolies, buyers make every exertion to lower prices, and sellers to raise them. Men who live by fees and salaries endeavor to raise them, and the part of the people who pay them endeavor to lower them. The public creditors to augment the taxes, and the people at large to lessen them. Thus in every period of society, and in all the transactions of men, we see parties verifying the observations made by the Marquis and those classes which have not their sentinels in the government in proportion to what they have to gain or lose must infallibly be ruined. Efforts among parties are not merely confined to property. They contend for rank and distinctions. All their passions in turn are enlisted in political controversies. Men, elevated in society, are often disgusted with the changeableness of the democracy, and the latter are often agitated with the passions of jealousy and envy. The yeomanry possess a large share of property and strength, are nervous and firm in their opinions and habits. The mechanics of towns are ardent and changeable, honest and credulous. They are inconsiderable for numbers, weight, and strength, not always sufficiently stable for the supporting free governments. The fishing interest partakes partly of the strength and stability of the landed, and partly of the changeableness of the mechanic interest. As to merchants and traders, they are our agents in almost all money transactions, give activity to government, and possess a considerable share of influence in it. It has been observed by an able writer that frugal, industrious merchants are generally advocates for liberty. It is an observation, I believe, well-founded, that the schools produce but few advocates for republican forms of government. Gentlemen of the law, divinity, physic, and etc. probably form about a fourth part of the people, yet their political influence, perhaps, is equal to that of all the other descriptions of men, if we may judge from the appointments to Congress, the legal characters will often, in small representation, be the majority, but the more the representatives are increased, the more of the farmers, merchants, and etc. will be found to be brought into the government. 
These general observations will enable you to discern what I intend by different classes, and the general scope of my ideas when I contend for uniting and balancing their interests, feelings, opinions, and views in the legislature. We may not only so unite and balance these as to prevent a change in the government by the gradual exaltation of one part to the depression of others, but we may deprive many other advantages from the combination and full representation. A small representation can never be well informed as to the circumstances of the people. The members of it must be too far removed from the people in general to sympathize with them, and too few to communicate with them. A representation must be extremely imperfect where the representatives are not circumstanced to make the proper communications to their constituents, and where the constituents in turn cannot, with tolerable convenience, make known their wants, circumstances, and opinions to their representatives. Where there is but one representative to thirty thousand or forty thousand inhabitants, it appears to me he can only mix and be acquainted with the few respectable characters among his constituents, even double the federal representation, and then there must be a very great distance between the representatives and the people in general represented. On the proposed plan, the state of Delaware, the city of Philadelphia, the state of Rhode Island, the province of Maine, the county of Suffolk and Massachusetts, will have one representative each. There can be but little personal knowledge, or but few communications, between him and the people at large of either of those districts. It has been observed that mixing only with the respectable men, he will get the best information and ideas from them. He will also receive impressions favorable to their purposes particularly. Many plausible shifts have been made to divert the mind from dwelling on this defective representation. These I shall consider in another place. Could we get over all our difficulties respecting a balance of interests and party efforts to raise some and oppress others, the want of sympathy, information, and intercourse between the representatives and the people, an insuperable difficulty will still remain. I mean the constant liability of a small number of representatives to private combinations. The tyranny of the one or the licentiousness of the multitude are, in my mind, but small evils compared with the factions of the few. It is a consideration well worth pursuing how far this House of Representatives will be liable to be formed into private juntos, how far influenced by expectations of appointments and offices, how far liable to be managed by the President and Senate, and how far the people will have confidence in them. To obviate difficulties on this head, as well as objections to the representative branch, generally several observations have been made. These I will now examine, and if they shall appear to be unfounded, the objections must stand unanswered. That the people are the electors must elect good men and attend to the administration. It is said that the members of Congress at stated periods must return home, and that they must be subject to the laws they make, and to, and to a share of the burdens they may impose. That the people possess the strong arm to overawe their rulers, and the best checks in their national character against the abuses of power, that the supreme power will remain in them. That the state governments will form a part of and a balance in the system that Congress will have only a few national objects to attend to, and the state governments many and local ones, that the new Congress will be more numerous than the present, and that any numerous body is unwieldy and mobbish, that the states are only represented in the present Congress, and that the people will require a representation in the new one, that in fifty or a hundred years the representation will be numerous that Congress will have no temptation to do wrong, and that no system to enslave the people is practicable, that as long as the people are free they will preserve free governments, and that when they shall become tired of freedom, arbitrary government must take place. These observations I shall examine in the course of my letters, and, I think, not only show that they are not well founded, but point out the fallacy of some of them, and show that others do not very well comport with the dignified and manly sentiments of a free and enlightened people. Yours, etc., The Federal Farmer. End of Anti-Federalist, Number 9.